Hello YouTube and welcome to this channel. I'm Bilal Durubia, a fifth year medical student and I want to use this channel to... because I often read many articles and I find many things which are really interesting and I think why don't they teach us this in medical school? Why do they only keep teaching us about things like well you hear the systolic murmur at the aortic stenosis or the CFTR gene is responsible, is responsible for cystic fibrosis at the seventh chromosome but we are rarely ever taught practical things about clinical medicine of how we interact with our patients and how to make decisions and our everyday problems that we will be facing as future physicians. So this channel has been created to hopefully share some of this, uh, these things that I come across and anything that will be helpful actually to medical students for my colleagues in this university and anywhere around the world. Now that we're done with the introductions, today I'll be talking about something I read about from a couple of articles. Um, they're all titled towards the same title, but the two major articles that I'll be using in this video and the next couple of videos which will be talking about the same topic, it's titled Cognitive Debiasing 1 and Cognitive Debiasing 2, published by the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, in 2013. So I'll give you this question. If we say a bat and a ball, so a baseball bat and a ball cost $1.1, okay? And that the bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Now, I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about that. But regardless now of what answer you choose, whether it's the right answer or the wrong answer, most probably the first answer that came to your mind is that the ball costs 10 cents so 0.1 dollars but if you think about this problem problem now more slowly and you deliberately think about it using the mathematics that you know if you say that the ball costs 10 cents and that the bat costs one dollar more than the ball then you will reach that the total sum will be 1.2 dollars which is wrong so the only conclusion is that the ball costs five cents and the bat costs one dollar and five cents we should first be familiar with a couple of concepts from psychology if any of you are interested in psychology you definitely have heard of a book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. In this book, he talks about thinking fast and slow, two dual processes in which our brains think. We have system one and system two, fast and slow. System one is intuitive, heuristical. Heuristical means it uses a lot of stereotypes and shortcuts. Why? Because it is automatic in its um, processes. So it is low energy consuming and it is fast. It is effortless as well. It has low reliability because of that speed and because of these shortcuts that it uses. So it gives us a lot of quick results, but some of them can be wrong because it is a low quality system. It is vulnerable to error, like we said. It is highly affected by context, by emotions. And because of this, of course, it has low scientific and analytical rigor. So it doesn't really rely much on numbers and statistics and logic, but it's more of influenced by emotions. And the first thought that comes to your mind, that's system one. Whereas system two is analytical, systematic, deliberate, conscious. It is highly consistent and reliable and analytical. And it has high scientific rigor. So again, system one and system two. System one is fast, system two is slow. System one is highly variable affected by context and emotions. System two is more consistent. It is more affected by logic and statistics and uh, analytical processes. So, now that we have explained system one and system two, you may be thinking, how is that relevant to clinical medicine? Why should I know this? Why should... And we will be bringing now examples of where the, these can go wrong and how we can be better educated to avoid these uh, cognitive biases and heuristics in our clinical practice. As the authors say in the article Cognitive Debiasing in 2013, they give an example where a 19-year-old obese woman 
admitted to the psychiatry ward for an anxiety and panic attacks, she complains of some symptoms of respiratory infection. So they send her to the emergency department to rule out pneumonia. At the triage, she is noted to have elevated heart rate and respiratory rate as well as hypoxia. They send her to be reviewed by the emergency medical residents and they order an x-ray. The x-ray is clear and she does not have pneumonia. The residents discuss it together and they decide that she does not have pneumonia and her symptoms are attributed to her anxiety. Therefore, they decide to discharge her. The patient leaves the emergency department, but soon after leaving the door, she has a cardiac arrest. She is immediately brought back to the emergency department for resuscitation. Unfortunately, the efforts were in vain and she dies. On autopsy, she was noted to have a saddle embolus and multiple emboli in the pulmonary circulation scattered throughout the lungs. Now, what does this tell us? And how did things go wrong for this patient where she had these symptoms of shortness of breath, chest pain, palpitations, hypoxia, and a rapid respiratory rate? And yet, she was missed and she was diagnosed as an anxiety and panic attacks. What we observed in this example is called the psych out error. It has been noted that psychiatric patients sometimes are under evaluated in history. They are under examined and under uh, investigated because their symptoms are often thought to be caused or exacerbated by their previously known psychiatric illnesses. So if I'm a physician in the emergency department and someone comes to me with chest pain, the two top differentials that I will be evaluating in this circumstances would be uh, chest pain due to acute coronary syndrome, whether it is acute MI, angina and such, or a pulmonary embolus. These would be the top differentials without which I would have to consider at the top of my list. But sometimes now in this scenario, as we've seen, because the patient is previously known and she came from a psychiatric hospital and she's known to have an anxiety and panic attacks, the physicians, unfortunately, they easily missed this diagnosis and they did not think of the differential of a pulmonary embolus. She was discharged because she was assumed to not have pneumonia, but it was too late after she came with a cardiac arrest for her to ultimately be found at autopsy to have these pulmonary emboli, which were really the cause of her recurrent bouts of chest pain and anxiety and uh, palpitations and, and tachycardia. So in this case, this psych out error resulted in the death of a patient. And this could have been probably prevented if the physicians correctly evaluated this patient and followed the proper protocols for them to first rule out the most serious scenarios and causes such as heart disease and pulmonary emboli. And then after ruling these out, they could have diagnosed her with anxiety and panic attacks. Although the physicians did order an x-ray and they did rule out pneumonia, but they were not thorough in their investigation. So instead of just uh, of, of ruling out the top most dangerous diseases, they only ruled out pneumonia and then discharged her. And this was a fatal mistake. So we should be aware of the psych out error and never be biased against psychiatric patients or people whom we suspect they have psychiatric illnesses. After learning about the psych out error, we should be active in our thinking process and always consider other differentials in psychiatric patients and leave out the least dangerous ones like a panic attack. We should leave it out at the bottom of the list because we have first to rule out more serious causes. A good idea to use when we are evaluating such patients would be thinking, what would I do for this patient if I did not think he had a prior mental illness? So if anyone came to me with chest pain, how would I treat him? Am I doing something discriminating or different for this patient just because I'm stereotyping him into a specific group like being a psychiatric patient? Because regardless if he's psychiatric or not, psychiatric patients can also have medical complaints and they should be taken seriously. Another medical example that we should talk about is the anchoring effect. And salesmen use it all the time. Forget medicine now for a couple of seconds. 
and let's just think of a scenario you've definitely all encountered this you are walking through the mall and you see a nice coat that you like or a nice product regardless of what it is and you look at the label for the price the price tag and you see that for example a thousand dollars and you see it cost and now you see a discount that says now 560 and you think in your head wow that is an excellent price and you want to buy it but why is that psychologists tell us that this is called the anchoring effect when you think that the original price is a thousand and now it went down to 500 or 560 you are thinking oh my god i'm going to be saving so much money because the original original price is so high but i'm saving money now by buying this so you go for it even if you didn't really need that product now how is this relevant to medicine it is because the anchor it's not only for prices and shopping but it is also anything that applies for the initial piece of information so we generally tend to think around the anchor around the original piece of information that we have we are given so now that we have taken an example from real life let's take an example in clinical medicine and see how it's relevant to our daily life as practitioners a 20 year old patient male has been having abdominal pain and vomiting for a day and a half now and he comes to the emergency department complaining of these things abdominal pain and vomiting and he's really sick so the triage nurse directs him to the surgery ward for him to be evaluated the surgery residents examine him and it is unremarkable they order a CT of the abdomen and they don't have any major findings as well of course this is used to evaluate for things like uh, appendicitis or obstruction and he doesn't have these either so they send him for the medical ward and they do a glucose check they find that his serum glucose is 500 the medical residents do more workup for for urine ketones and the pH and such and they diagnose him with diabetic ketoacidosis now what was wrong here the patient had abdominal pain and vomiting and he was sent for surgery the surgeons now evaluated him for the differential diagnoses that they think of so they thought of cholecystitis appendicitis cholangitis pyronephritis and once these diagnoses were not there the residents they ordered more workup for ct for example and it was negative as well this resulted in two things there was unnecessary investigation they did a ct and it has a high cost and exposure for radiation and avoiding it would be ideal if it is unnecessary and they also delayed the diagnosis of the patient and his management as well but as as soon as he was sent for the medical residence they did a look check and they found the actual diagnosis let's go back and rewind the clock and stop at the triage if now the triage nurse sent him directly for the medical department the internal medicine they would have probably thought of this differential diagnosis sooner because it is their area of specialty and it is in their differential diagnosis but since he was sent for surgery he was evaluated he had investigation maybe and the diagnosis was delayed so an important concept to keep in mind in our clinical practice is anchoring the anchoring effect or triage queuing it is the really, really the same concept because our anchor was in this example the nurse which triaged this patient for surgery or medicine now of course the nurse can never really diagnose him instantly it's not the error of the nurse that she sends him to the surgical ward but physicians should always keep in mind the so it's not the mistake of the nurse because she definitely cannot diagnose everyone in a couple of seconds at the triage it's only her job to classify to classify the patients roughly before they are diagnosed by the physicians in their respective wards but the physicians now should learn to keep an open mind and consider the alternative diagnoses first think am i diagnosing am i considering the correct differential diagnoses and am i ruling out any diagnosis early okay guys so a quick summary for the video we have system one system two and they have different advantages and disadvantages system one is highly susceptible to errors and because of this we have cognitive biases affecting us there are many cognitive biases in medicine and we will be talking about them of course in the next videos as well today we talked about two effects the psych out error in which psychiatric patients are often under evaluated under examined and under investigated which can result 
to which can result in harm to these patients. The other effect is called the triage queuing or the anchoring effect in the general umbrella in which the initial piece of information can bias us and narrow our view in a specific field and make us miss other diagnoses or delay the proper management for that patient. I hope that this video taught you something new. If it did, please like and subscribe and let me know of anything that you think of in the comment section below. I'll be talking about more of these cognitive biases in future videos for them to be more doable. Until next time.